everybody. It's Tyler here at FMA Seneca checking in with 1640 Sabotage. This team been following them for a really long time. They have a lot of cool stuff in the robot. I think one of the things I think of with Sabotage is always custom swerve and what they have to bring for that. But this team has so much more to offer as well too. Talking about some really cool carbon fiber stuff. You look at this robot going through that whole packaging aspect of doing it. They're doing some really cool things with machine learning and other great programming things as well too. So let's learn more about this awesome team. Last year winning Engineering Inspiration Award. Looking for big things here at Seneca coming up on Behind the Buffers. This video on fun is brought to you by viewers like you and also in partnership with the following. Discover how Kettering University students engineered their success with Kettering's amazing co-op employment programs where students earn great pay and gain valuable experience. Those accepted into Kettering University can apply for a robotic scholarship providing up to an additional $5,000 a year in tuition assistance. Head on over to kettering.edu slash first to learn more and apply. Support funds content creators when you sign up for a membership on YouTube Join. You'll get access to special perks like emotes, loyalty badges, and fund members will even get early access to our scheduled videos and more. 100% of this revenue will go back to our correspondents to help recognize their efforts. Click the join button in any YouTube video to pledge your support. Olivia, let's start with an awesome overview of this robot. Your team has uh, approached Crescendo so well. So talk to me about the robot that you have itself, how you've been approaching Crescendo, and you've been doing so well at this event so far. Tell me more about it. All right, so we worked really hard designing the robot, and we wanted to try to be able to shoot, amp, speaker. Um, obviously, we wanted to go with Swerve, but the robot itself is Dubot 19, or known as Cypher. Um, it is 27.9 by 27.9 inches. It weighs 110.3 pounds without a battery. And you will also notice it is powder coated. Yellow and blue are two colors. All that powder coating is done in-house by the students. When you're looking at the Crescendo game, for you personally, what were you most excited about with Crescendo and your team tackling it? I was really excited about the chain climb because I think that's just such a unique climb that will like it's never going to be the same climb twice because of how the chain moved and effects of different robots on it. Let's pass over to Julia. It's going to be talking about something really cool. You got some carbon fiber paneling in this robot as well, too. Uh, so run me through uh, what really, you know, not just, you know, what it is, but why did you choose to go this route and uh, what cool things come out of it? Yes, so as you can see, we have carbon fiber for our side panels, back panel, and e-panel. We do this all in shop. It is an isotropic layup, meaning that the carbon fiber um, threads run in all different directions. That way the robot can be as strong as possible. We do this by um, using layers of carbon fiber to fortify the plot wood that is used for our side panels, back panel, and e-panel, and um, that is layered with carbon fiber and epoxy. Um, this year, actually, something interesting we did, we made the e-panel a little bit thicker. Um, so everything needs to be super reinforced on the side panels and back panel. We know that because we're going to be taking a lot of hits, um, especially because this game is going to be very defensive. But for the e-panel, um, it is actually a structural element this year. Therefore, it needs to be a little bit thicker. It's very cool. Let's continue on this robot. I'll also be talking about the uh, intake uh, of this machine as well, too. So let's go through it. You're doing an awesome under the bumper intake. Walk me through uh, how this design process worked out. Anything cool you want to point out with it? All right, yes, uh, our intake is an under the bumper intake like you mentioned. We wanted an under the bumper intake because we knew we were going to be moving across the field very quickly and an over the bumper intake just introduced a little bit more risk when moving quickly in a swerve game like this. Our main revisions on the intake have to do with the compression of the notes going into the intake. We tested different amounts of compression, different wheels, different wheel materials, different durometer to get a good uh, to get good control over the note through the intaking process while not damaging the notes. Another interesting aspect of our intake has to be our passive roller. This roller moves the note from the intake directly into our indexer without power and it's an interesting aspect for our robot because it wasn't initially intended to be there. Um, we were playing with it as a structural piece and it just happened to work out in our favor that it could be used as a passive index or handoff. Can we see a note come in and see what that process looks like? It's a very smooth uh, process that you have there with that. Uh, you know, you talked about using different durometer wheels and that sort of thing. Any other uh, challenges that you face trying to package your robot this way? Yes. The under the bumper intake 
really limited our space capacity of the robot. Typically for our, our electronics panel, we want to use the entire base of the robot for electronics, but with this intake, we've really limited our bottom surface area of the robot, so we needed to think about how we wanted to deal with electronics, how we wanted to mount our climber gear boxes down in on our e-panel, and how we were going to deal with the angle of our shooter in relation to the space that the intake takes up. Well, let's get into your shooter. Noah's, Noah's going to cover more about that. So uh, talk about, you got a, just a great design. We talked about packaging on this, but you're doing some cool things on how you tested to get your spin right. So talk more about uh, that and then anything else cool on the, the shooter that you want to point out. Yeah, sure. So just like the intake, like you said, that we did a lot of testing with the shooter. Um, one of the things that we tested a lot was the different speeds. So since we're running four different motors on our shooter, we're able to control each quadrant of the shooter independently um, and this proves really useful in um, the consistency of our shots from a distance so we're actually adding a spin by changing the speed of our left and right motor so we're running one side faster than the other to create a spin so that the notes more stable in the air we're also utilizing the four motors um, with the amp so we're running the bottom much faster than the top so that we can get an almost parallel landing with the back wall um, for the note um, scoring into the amp so yeah. So we had a chance to see a lot of your uh, speaker shots, but I didn't get a chance to see too many of your amp shots. Can we see what that looks like? So nice and smooth with that. Now, one thing I'll ask you, looking at a shot like that, is that you are going a little bit upwards trajectory on that. Uh, how do you uh, mitigate like that backstop or trying to get the amp shots in? Has it been pretty smooth for you so far? Yeah, it's been really smooth. So we're running the speeds pretty low so that we don't hit the top of the amp. And like I said, we're running the bottom motors a lot faster so that we can really have the note flip in the air and enter the amp consistently and smoothly. Let's start again some of the really great programming uh, on this robot as well too. Justin's going to be uh, talking about uh, the uh, odometry that goes into it and we'll talk about uh, April tags as well too, how you're uh, bringing that all together to get some great vision on the field. Yeah, so we have a limelight at the front of our robot uh, right here. This uh, is detecting April tags at all times as we drive across the field. So uh, we can get readings uh, constantly and constantly adjust for our, the error in our real velocities. Um, we use uh, a Kalman filter that WPI Load provides um, to uh, be able to merge the data from our real velocities and the April tags, and we can tune these standard deviations that can get that to be more accurate. Uh, if you'd like, I can show you on uh, Advantage Kit what some of our odometry might look like in a match. So right here, you can see as we drive around, it uh, is updating the, those jitters that you see is the updating with the April tags but to adjust, off the, adjust the odometry it's getting from real velocity. Um, so some cool things that we do with this odometry uh, is we are able to automatically rotate towards the shooter uh, and use a PID to angle this to face the to be at a good angle that we got by uh, tuning a bunch of different shots and fitting a curve to some shot data. Uh, this lets us automatically figure out the distance from the shooter, depending on the red and blue lines, uh, point that angle, rotate towards the shooter, and make a shot that goes in. Um, we also use odometry to do some other cool things, like uh, disabling the power on the shooter motors when we go to a specific side of the field, uh, so to conserve power. Um, with our swerve modules, uh, we're doing some uh, different math with that than uh, some other teams. Most teams, uh, what they do is they desaturate their swerve modules. If you're both driving at max speed and rotating at max speed, uh, this will cause your command your robot to go at twice its maximum possible speed. Uh, most teams desaturate their uh, speeds to then be inside of the valid input space of your swerve modules. What we do instead is um, uh, we fit the, using two inverted cones on top of each other, we can much more accurately fit our controller's input space to our robot's uh, valid input space, giving us a much more precision with what we can uh, move on the controller. Our driver can uh, have more possible values and a more larger range of possible values while driving uh, on the swerve drive. We also use what we call drive weights, which allow our drive to be influenced by multiple things simultaneously. Uh, this includes so the joystick, so we can drive around with the joystick while also, for example, rotating towards to face the speaker. Um, this means that uh, uh, as so as we drive around, we can rotate to face the speaker and uh, drive around, and it can influence that. One other thing that we use with the drive weights is machine learning, uh, and we have a limelight in the back for that. And I'm going to hand it off to Rini to talk about some machine learning.
Okay, so as Justin mentioned, one of our really cool one of our really cool driveways actually uses machine learning for note detection, and it's only used during teleop right now. But we use a Limelight in conjunction with a Google Coral as our USB accelerator, which allows us to handle the complex object detection needed to detect notes. Now we chose this over something like blob detection because it's just so much more consistent and reliable. But the way in a match it works is board, our driver can actually see what our camera is seeing. He can see when it senses a note, and all he has to do is press a button, and it does the rest autonomously. It will drive up, intake the note, and he's all good to go. So at the beginning of the season, we experimented with using our own, training our own model, before settling on the Limelight published one, which has been working pretty well. Um, and yeah, uh, we're excited to incorporate this into other features of the robot. One thing that we got to wrap up with, we talked about that awesome custom sword drive that you're doing. Uh, so Kristen, talk to me more about what's gone into this. Uh, every single year, I think this is something to really marvel at with your team and what you've been doing. So run me through uh, all the cool custom work. I love the 3D printing on it. Talk to me more about it. All right, so a lot of teams buy their Swerve, and obviously we build our own custom Swerve in-house. So Dean is going to talk about our treads and our heat-treated gears. So the past competition season, we realized that our gears were kind of wearing down and they weren't really holding up that well. So a process that we started to do was heat treatment on them. So essentially what we did was we took a flame and we started heating up the gear until it was cherry red. What this did was the crystals inside the gear would be able to move around easily and be able to be stronger. So next we would dunk these gears into oil to cool them up. After they were cool, after that we cooled them up, the crystals inside would be all comp compacted together and it would be just stronger to use. Next, I will talk about our 3D printed treads. So over the past two years, we have prototyped different treads that we could use on our wheels. We first started with these bike tires with fishing lines on them, but they didn't work well and they kept on falling apart. Next, we started 3D printing our treads with soft TPU and what we did, we we did different patterns and different shapes and to see which was stronger and which would wear less. And we came to the conclusion that these big ye yellow squares would be better and would wear less while on the field. All right, so next I'm gonna talk about our carbon fiber forks. So as you can see, our wheel supports here are made of carbon fiber. So what we do is we take resin printed molds pack them with dry carbon fiber and then vacuum infuse epoxy through. Kind of looks something like this. Originally we started taking our dry carbon, mixing it with elementing epoxy and then stuffing it in the molds, but about 50% of our forks um, had voids and were not as strong as using dry carbon and then vacuum infusing the epoxy through. Um, and we also switched to a uh, va special vacuum infusion epoxy, which is thinner and stronger. We did a smash test comparing our 3D printed forks and the different types of epoxy, and this type of epoxy was the strongest. So here's a picture of us doing the uh, carbon fiber vacuum infusion. Um, and yeah, they're really durable. We haven't had a failure on them yet. And overall, our you know custom swerve modules, the flexibility of the design is a great benefit. And for example, we can iterate upon the design. We added C-clips and O-rings to hold things in place. And yeah, that's our custom swerve. Well, Sabotage, thank you so much for taking time. Tell us about your team and your robot. Fantastic machine. You all building great robots every year and also a great inspiration to the community. Thanks a lot and good luck here at Seneca. Thank you. This video on fun is brought to you by viewers like you and also in partnership with the following. Discover how Kettering University students engineer their success with Kettering's amazing co-op employment programs where students earn great pay and gain valuable experience. Those accepted into Kettering University can apply for a robotics scholarship providing up to an additional $5,000 a year in tuition assistance. Head on over to Kettering.edu first to learn more and apply.